A complete discussion of synchronous languages would take me far afield, but I'd like to show you a couple of simple examples in Estero so, uh, to give you a flavor of the syntax and the execution semantics. The one and only time construct in the language is the pause statement. It causes the program to delay until the next clock tick. This first example has two sequences executing in parallel. When the module starts, both sequences start. The top one hits the pause statement, which waits until the next clock tick. The bottom one immediately emits the output signal Y and then hits the pause statement. On the next clock tick, the top sequence resumes where it's left off at the pause statement and emits X and pauses again. The bottom sequence hits another pause statement right away. On the third clock tick, the top sequence emits Z and finishes. The bottom sequence emits Y and finishes also. So the parallel construction finishes and the module finishes. A more interesting example illustrates waiting for the occurrence of two signals, A and B, simultaneously or one before the other, at which point the output signal O is emitted. This is an infinite, in an infinite loop, which is restarted each time the signal R is detected. The await statement and the loop each statement are derived statements that have embedded pause statements within them. There's a lot more to Estorel, of course, but this glimpse is sufficient for our purposes of, of discussing the role of timing in the language. An Estorel program is essentially a text description of a finite state machine, and as such, it's amenable to using model checkers or theorem provers to prove certain safety assertions. For instance, in a landing, uh, aircraft landing gear controller, it might be desirable to prove that the gear is deployed whenever the aircraft is less than 200 feet above ground. This is a much more tractable problem in a synchronous language than in C. The ability to prove assertions about the program is what makes synchronous languages attractive for in safety critical applications. But the synchronous hypothesis has some downsides. From a language perspective, since all signals are updated instantaneously, it's easy to write a program that is overspecified or in the worst case, violates causality. The compiler can usually detect these situations, but changing the program to avoid them may require significant effort. From an implementation point of view, it may turn out that the computation updating all of the signals sometimes takes longer than a clock tick on the target platform. If this happens, a clock can be slowed, a faster target can be chosen, or the program can be modified to effectively pipeline the computation, and that may take considerable effort. The LabVIEW equivalent of a synchronous program is a state machine in a simple timed loop. And the ultimate feasibility of the program depends on being able to update the state machine when the clock, within a clock period. There's another interesting research language called Giotto, which approaches the integration of time by focusing on loops as opposed to event reactions. The fundamental building block is a task with inputs and outputs, Tasks run re repetitively at rates that are integer multiples of some base rate and which start at the same time so that every base period they line up again. A collection of tasks and rates is referred to as a mode. The program can have multiple modes and has provision for switching modes in a way that never has to abort a task. Drivers are responsible for reading system inputs, writing system outputs, and for copying from task outputs to task inputs. The synchronous hypothesis manifests itself in Giotto with the assumption that these drivers take zero time to execute. This simplifies the analysis of the program, but feasibility is still dependent on being able to find a real schedule on the target machine, which can accommodate the task ex execution times as well as the worst case time that the drivers actually take. From a LabVIEW perspective, a Giotto program is a collection of timed loops communicating through double buffered shared variables. The time loop is the state of the art in integrating time into a program language. And LabVIEW has the most flexible and powerful representation and implementation. But there's still more that can be done to integrate time into a language. For instance, consider how you select a clock source for the time loop. Most commonly, you select it from a predetermined list of clock sources listed in the pop-up menu. Then you set the period in terms of this clock base as another input to the timed loop. Where do the clock sources come from, and how are they related? 
This is magic that happens behind the scenes and there's no depiction anywhere to illustrate it. If we look at a simple control example, we'll discover another aspect of timing which isn't fully addressed. As shown in this example, two sensors are read at the start of the diagram in the body of the loop. If the setup times to make the readings differ, the sensor readings will not occur simultaneously. The way you typically deal with this situation is to configure a hardware sample clock that triggers both sensors to make readings at the same time. But where is that sample clock shown? and how are the sample clocks of the I.O. points in various time loops related. Again, all of that is magic that happens behind the scenes without any direct representation. There are hardware API calls to configure the timing and routing of sample clocks, but there's no explicit representation of that information. It's encoded in the parameters to the API. What we need is a wire to connect timing sources and sample clocks to the operators that require them, and I'll have more to say about that in a minute. But first, I want to make one other point using this example. When a sample clock is connected to the sensors and a clock source is chosen for the time loop, we have overspecified the system, since the time loop must run at the same rate as the sample clock. This is artificial complexity in having to specify redundant information. The time loop is scheduling the software to match the hardware timing, but that's something that should be derivable from the hardware timing without requiring separate specification. This is the crux of the matter, in my opinion, and it's a very challenging problem with lots of people working on it from lots of different perspectives. It's effectively combining hardware design and software design, and the problem is made more difficult because of the clash of two cultures. The computer science curriculum, for the most part, still does not deal with timing, and CS graduates have little or no experience or even interest in timing other than making their code run fast. On the other hand, Hardware designers are obsessed with timing and want to control it everywhere, even with the risk of over-constraining their designs. They're typically loath to use abstraction, probably because they look over the fence and see the abstraction software designers use, like dynamic dispatch and garbage collection, and shudder at the timing consequences. Meanwhile, the system designer is interested in succinctly specifying the critical timing in the system using a high level of abstraction to specify the rest of the behavior and relying on the compiler to schedule everything as appropriate. He also expects to be able to verify system behaviors at a high level and have the compiler prove that those behaviors are preserved in the deployed system. We need abstraction in order to compre comprehend large applications and we need precise timing in order to specify and realize the applications. Finding the best abstraction for computation and timing is the holy grail everyone is after. I said earlier that the only timing that should be necessary to specify is the timing of the physical I.O. Another way to say this is that the software concept of time only needs to agree with the hardware concept of time at the sensor and actuator points. Everywhere else, software time can be faster or slower than real time. This is the perspective being taken by the Berkeley Tides project. In this project, timestamps are associated with sensors, and as the data flows through the program, it encounters actors that process the data and actors that advance the timestamp. A timestamp that is advanced acts like a timing constraint on the actuator, namely the time at which the actuator must output the value. The value and its strictly future timestamp must appear at the actuator before the hardware real-time clock reaches that time. The actuator thus holds up execution of the program until real-time catches up with the future timestamp. This is the way the software is synchronized to real-time only at the sensor and actuator points. The delay actor, somewhat counterintuitively, is what advances the timestamp. In the top feedback loop, Delay 1 generates the next sample clock for the sensor, and the bottom path, Delay 2, generates the deadline for the actuator. Tides is, strictly speaking, not a data flow system, but rather a discrete event simulator repurposed as a design language. Events flow on the wires rather than simply data. As a result, actors with multiple inputs must be concerned with merging events and preserving causality at their outputs.